All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of Raising the Flipping Bar. I've got Adrian Kinney here. Welcome to Raising the Flipping Bar, Adrian. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. So Adrian is with MidMod Colorado. And what I'm really excited about is to have you here to talk about not only the investment space, but how mid-century modern really plays a key role in the Denver metro real estate market. Um, let's um, let's kind of jump into your background, actually. Tell me a little bit first what you were doing before you got into real estate, because you've got a really interesting background that I think a lot of our guests some viewers would like to learn about. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, we're enough born and raised here. Uh, went up to CSU for undergrad. Uh, go Rams! Always have to give a nice yep. little plug for them. There you go. Uh, majored in business with focus in real estate, which is a very niche thing that they have up there. Uh, fortunate enough to go through it, and out of there, jumped into property management. First of all, right out of college. Okay. Uh, great crash course in real estate. Did you know property management is not fun? Yes. Uh, dealing with everyone's problems all the time from all the different angles is just a tough one. Yep. Uh, from there, I actually moved over to the Denver County Assessor's Office. So I worked with assessing. Real property uh, on the single family detached side of things. Okay. So I actually had a property uh, background in taxes uh, and actually got my real or my appraisal license. Oh, I didn't know that. Yep. So I got that. So it's kind of now today really helps with clients when I have yeah. to talk to appraisers that I'm not just an agent trying to get a value. I actually understand how the appraisal process works and can give them kind of the background that I have for it as well. Uh, in addition to that tax background, you know, especially as values went up, I had a lot of clients asking me like, hey, is this an actual accurate value or should we be looking into this? Yeah. So it's been really nice to be able to kind of have those two backgrounds. Uh, and then kind of my last spot of it was the state of Colorado picked me up to work for the state assessed office. Uh, our constitution has a certain amount of industries that are assessed at the state level and not the local level. Mm-hmm. So I was using a lot of essentially pro forma backgrounds on, you know, uh, income ROIs, NOIs to get value for major corporations, uh, airlines, railroads, uh, telecom. We portion those out to the counties and then pass them on. And then I also was doing the uh, kind of teaching the classes to the appraisal offices throughout the Denver metro and uh, the Colorado area for the 64 counties. Okay. So I have a background team, kind of that appraisal teaching side of stuff. 2015, uh, maybe a year or two before, really got into the whole mid-century thing. Mm-hmm. We bought our first Cliff May house in uh, Harvey Park. Nice. Fell in love with it. Uh, started to sell a couple of neighbors' houses. It was just kind of the classic, you know, on the side agent. Yep. Market was going up, so I'll definitely give some credit to that. But I was able to market stuff a little bit differently than most agents had before. Really talked about what kind of house this was and, you know, why it was significant and who the heck was this Cliff May guy and why was he important and why are they in Colorado? Yeah. Really got that out. Started getting crazy values we started seeing in Harvey Park in each one of these sales. Of course, brought people out of the woodwork. Sellers came to me and they're like, hey, you live here. You got a lot of money for that house. You want want to sell it? Started to realize, and then by about October of 2015, which uh, we're coming up on now for my full exit from uh, paid work from somebody else, right? jumped into this full-time, uh, have now done five fix and flips in the Cliff May world, okay. uh, have lived in three primary slow flips that we did while we lived in them, mm-hmm. uh, sold 40, 50 Cliff May houses over the last uh, 10 years. So it's been quite a journey. Nice. Uh, definitely a passion side of things. It's not just uh, that it's trendy. I actually love it. Live in a mid-century house. I've done a lot of work on it. I've done all the houses I've done have been mid-mod flips. So it's it's a true passion of mine, not just because, uh, you know, somebody says it's trendy right now. No, and I and we're definitely going to dive into um, kind of the nuances of mid-century modern, but I do want to touch on, tell our audience a little bit about, you brought up a great point about appraisals and how real estate agents and real estate professionals can definitely give opinions on what we think the property is worth from an investment side and from a flipping side, we've got the ARV, which stands for after repair value. We kind of try to peg that number, but it's all got to be based on does the property appraise so that the person buying it can get a loan. Maybe just explain to our, our you know audience what that entails. And, and I think that's a great skill set that you've got. No, absolutely. And it's uh, it's even more nuanced too, as you get into unique properties, mid-century being one of them, where their uh, price points are, especially in Colorado and Denver, finally appreciated for what they are, where their price per square foot is usually considerably higher than most of the classic ranches or just an average house that's around them. So as I ushered the Cliff Maze kind of up this giant price scale, there's a lot of brick ranches with basements around them that were technically twice as valuable because they have twice as much square footage, but these Cliff Maze were the same sales price, making the Cliff Maze a 2x on the price per square foot. And it was a really tough thing for these appraisers to understand, like, Mm -hmm why is this house with twice the square footage going for the same price as this one that's half with, you know, no brick. It doesn't look as nice. It's got a whole bunch of windows. It's stick built. Like what, what's the difference? Uh, the appraisal side, and this goes for all of them is, you know, it's a very boiled down system. Uh, when you get to the kind of appraisal world, the 
unfortunately, the appraisers today are checking off boxes for some of these. I know they're trying to automate a lot of it on the Fannie and Freddie side of, you know, does it check this? Does it fit these metrics? Um, but the one-offs or the well-done, some things are really tough to do where, you know, there's formulas for fix and flips. You know right. how they go. You yep. know, there's there's proper corners to cuts and there's proper corners not to cut. And some fix and flippers do cut zero corners and some cut all the corners. Right. And on paper, they're all updated and finished. Then you get into issues of, you know, why is this one 100,000 more when next door was the same and it looks the same on paper while this one has wolf ranges and fancy this and, you know, high end everything on it. And so it's, you know, talking to the appraisers when you meet them at the property is first of all, key, make sure as a listing agent, you're meeting the agent or the appraiser there because you really want to talk to them about the nuances that are there. It's also a fine needle to thread because you're a professional. They're also a professional. Yeah. You know, if you're telling them, Hey, here's the value. It's like, Hey, you know, I I have a license. I'm also doing my job to, you know, I have to appraise this at the end of the day. Um, so it, Make sure you meet them. I mean, that's really the, the main point to get across is talk to them, know your comps. That's a big part of it. Yeah. Make sure the comps are tight around the value of the house in the sense of the price per square foot is close. The square footage itself is close. Um, it's the same style of house. You know, if you've got a, a four story, you know, stick built town home and you've got a ranch, not the same kind of property, yeah. even though the value is what you want from it. You have to make sure that they match the same kind of property. Yeah. Uh, make sure that in the last couple of months, uh, as you would probably know now, market's been all over the board. I you know we peaked in June of 2022 for most of the Denver metro area. We got back to those values probably the end of July of 23, but it was kind of a roller coaster through every one of those months that some were higher, some were lower. Mm-hmm. You know, but the trend line is we're we're back to where we were. So it's it, really talking to them, making sure that they understand you know where the values are at. They can't predict the future, unfortunately, in the appraisal world. Yep. So they have to look at historic sales, which is always tough in an appreciating market. And I know a lot of agents hate that part of it that, you know, gosh, what do we do? Because everything yeah. yesterday just got under contract for 100000 Until it's sold, it doesn't matter. Right. And then once it sells, then you can account for it going forward. As we had enough of a trend line, appraisers were actually starting to account and underwriting was letting them account for this upward projection saying, okay, yeah. everything is appreciating, you know, at 3% a month. We have three years of data. We'll let it fly now. Right. Especially at the beginning of this year where, you know, November, December of 22 was just a straight cliff downward. They couldn't use that upward projection for January and February. Uh, I had probably four or five appraisals that just weren't even close. Uh, even with my background and talking to them, they just couldn't use any trend line adjustment on them. And that's a tough one when you can't use that in a market that is appreciating. But historically, if you look at the data for three months, it's not appreciating. Yeah, It, it was a tough one. Yeah. And that's definitely something that we look at. And I want to hear kind of your thoughts on this of people writing in appraisal gap coverage. And so when we're really trying to teach our audience, okay, what's the best offer to take? I think everybody goes, oh, well, the highest number, Mm -hmm. potentially. But one of the big points, especially as it relates to mid-century modern, that I would love to hear your thoughts on is an appraisal gap and what that is and why that's really important if somebody's evaluating which deal do I pick if you're lucky enough to have multiple offers. Oh, absolutely. And those were uh, a, you know, a big part of it. Um, uh, You know, I think it's twofold on that. Uh, The first part is, you know, as an agent, you should have a very good idea, at least of, you know, what value should look like. Obviously, at the appraisal side, that's your whole job is to just strictly do value. Uh, but you should have a pretty dang good idea of where this would land. That's when you kind of talk to your seller of, hey, I can confidently say, you know, the highest sale here for this exact square footage was, you know, XYZ. This is XYZ plus 100000 Yeah. Which is essentially funny money because if you can't find a single comp, you know, within the tight mile radius, even if they let you go out a mile and a half or two miles from the subject property and there's nothing out there, you're going to not have an appraisal. It's going to hit exactly at, you know, what you listed it at because you were cognizant in your job. You know what you did. You listed it at that. The appraisal gap essentially says that they, the buyer will cover an amount and they can pick anything from one penny to infinite number. Mm -hmm to what they're comfortable with that they actually have cash for. And it's in addition to their down payment. Uh, unfortunately, especially right. for these first time buyers, this is what made the last three years so tough is, you know, they barely had five to 20% down. Then maybe they're looking at a gap of 20, 30, 40, $50,000. And that's that difference between the bank's appraisal saying, Hey, this is worth, you know, a hundred thousand dollars. Your offers for 150, 
we're only going to lend on the hundred thousand plus your down payment. So that hundred and fifty, you've got to find fifty thousand dollars somewhere, and that's where buyers were having to put into their contracts and say, "Hey, we'll co- we'll cover this money. We've got an extra fifty k. Maybe there's some parents. There's extra funds. Right. Maybe they're splitting up their twenty percent and doing ten percent down and ten percent for that gap coverage." But it essentially in a very competitive market really helps that seller feel like we are going to close at that one fifty. The Colorado contract default language for appraisals is if it doesn't hit, the buyer gets to submit an objection. Here's the appraisal. The seller and buyer can negotiate a new price. Maybe they get a couple extra thousand bucks out of the buyer. Everyone moves on. When you've got 20 offers and everyone's going to cover some type of gap, having no gap coverage makes it unfortunately a weak offer from the buyer. Right. And the seller will then lean towards somebody that says, yes, we're going to guarantee that we're going to close at this price. Even if the appraisal comes in at $1, we'll close it you know, a million dollars. We'll cover the difference. Yeah. Um, and it's very tough as a buyer's agent to you know, tell your buyer, yeah, you've got 20%, but also you need another 100K to buy this house because it's not going to appraise. Um, and especially as things were going up so quickly in 2020 and 2021, you basically had to say, you know, you've got to have that 50K or we can't bid on this house. It's uh, it's not funny money. And that kind of tees into that second point that, you know, a lot of folks are worried that all this rising in prices was going to collapse because it, was, it wasn't real. All of these offers that got accepted had some type of cash backing, mm-hmm. unfortunately. Uh, so this whole, you know, it might be a foreclosure wave type thing, you know, it was funny money. I had clients that were bringing 10 to, I think I had the biggest gap of about 80K that wow. they were bringing cash to the table above yeah. their their ga- or their uh, down payment amount. And, you know, the bank was like, cool, you know, we'll appraise at this number and great. If you want to close for more, you bring the cash and they brought it. Um, and that's at that time, you know, that 80K was eaten up in about six months and then they had the equity for it. Right. But at the time it was uh, actual money. It wasn't just like, yeah, sure. Well, you know, the 08 years where they're like, yeah, that's worth, you know, 4 million. Why not? You know, something down the street sold for two. So this is twice the square footage. So we'll give it 4 million. They weren't doing that anymore. Um, so it was really just, it was hard cash. It was 20%. It was super qualified buyers, especially during COVID when they were checking your job hours before closing. Some of these lenders were calling and being like, hey, does Joe Blow have a job here? Because yeah. uh, if they don't, we're going to terminate this whole deal and blow it up. Uh, so those, you know, as weird as the time of it was, they were actually very, very solid buyers and a lot of cash put down for making sure these gaps were covered. Um, and we're still seeing them now. Uh, not 100,000 over, not 200,000 over. Most of the I'm seeing is in that kind of three to seven percent over range. Yeah, I agree. And it's still gap though. A lot of these houses were at the max, and you're seeing it. But I'm finally seeing a decent chunk that there's you know a sale eight blocks over that you're like, oh, actually this one's pretty dang close, and it was under what we said, so we're not as worried about gap this time. Uh, unfortunately, I lost an offer this weekend on one. Uh, it was at 15k over list price, uh, but listing agent wasn't concerned about gap coverage. They had a, a sale that was pretty close within that 15 range, and they were able to take it. And you know, the winning offer didn't have gap coverage, and we didn't either. But we were both over list price. There was finally a comp to prove that where before every time was the highest sale. So it is it is shifting. There's still some gap coverage, but uh, it does make it tough. And I think that's why we're seeing a lot of these lower average prices as first time buyers are finally getting into the market and they're able to buy at that five fifty range, which those of you outside of Denver, unfortunately, that's a very cheap house yeah, in our crazy. Denver metro area. Yeah. Um, but they're actually able to compete this time, which is really nice to see that we can get kind of that first timers into this marketplace to start building wealth in, in real estate. Yeah. And I think the cool thing is we've jumped into some pretty kind of fun, you know, I'm going to call them advanced tactics and advanced terms, but I do want to back up just a little bit because it's your area of expertise and your sweet spot. So maybe give our audience a little bit of a definition of truly what is a mid-century modern home? What are some of the telltale signs that somebody's walking into a mid-century modern home. And then we'll get into why are these things selling for a premium, both that you've got to pay for super beat up disastrous homes. And then you, to your point on the cost per square foot basis, you're like, how in the hell are we able to sell it for this expensive? But it happens all day. So maybe just give our audience a de- definition of what it is. And then maybe some of your favorite architects and designers too, because you've got great experience that, that a lot of people in Metro Denver don't have. Oh, well, thank you very much. Uh, there, uh, you'll see, and I know it becomes, a, it became such a buzzword in the last, you know, five, 10 years, this whole mid-century modern, uh, you know, the furniture from the era, the reproduction of it, the percolated to, you know, CB2 and Crate and Barrel and uh, West Elm, you know, it's everywhere. It's this, you know, this slim furniture, wood furniture, it's, you know, sleek lines, you know, we're heading to the seventies and eighties now with furniture, it's, it's getting pretty bulky. Uh, but everyone used to use, and they still are using the, you know, mid-century modern, their description. And you kind of look at it and you're like, sure, that might be. 
it's become pretty diluted that yes. folks are like, all right, where's where's the line here for it? Uh, Denver metro area spe- specifically, we're about 1950-ish to about 1969 okay. uh, for the date stamps is kind of the first easy marker. There's, there's a couple on both sides that transitioned out of that, but that for the most part is when I'm doing a search, I'll kind of start with that range say, okay, we'll start here for it. Uh, when you get into the house uh, or even before you get in, it's that low slung roof line, low to the ground, They were built in this modernist style. Modernism, one of the key elements is connection with the land. Mm -hmm. So thus not a large something. It's low, it's sleek, you know, it disappears. It's supposed to have kind of an earthy tone to it. It's really supposed to connect indoor and outdoor. So then as you get in, you do have that indoor and outdoor. You have glass walls, uh, floor to ceiling walls in most parts of the house. Um, Large living spaces, very small bedrooms. Again, it was focused on the livability. So if you were entertaining, you could open up this space. The square footage is typically a lot smaller, but the livability is a lot bigger. Um, A lot of the 12 to 1500 square foot homes of the mid-century modern that are true MCMs, they live like they're 15 to 2500 square feet because you've got courtyards and backyards and glass walls and doors in every single room that go outside, those are really the aspects that make it feel like and truly are mid-century modern. Again, low slung roof line, typically smaller square footage, uh, earth tones, a lot of wood, stone. Those things are in those houses for the most part, uh, if they're still original and intact. Uh, Glass walls, connection to outside. And again, those weren't at the time they were novel concepts and now everyone's like, oh, this is a great modern house. And truly that's, you know, it's a modernist house because it was this idea and concept from in the 1950s and 1960s on how to start living. Because at the time it was those Sears craft homes. They were the two story yeah. ones that showed up on a, you know, if you order them from the Sears catalog, showed up on a train, you had the brick house, unloaded it and built your little, you know, two story home that uh, connection outside was zero. You had a front door and you had a back door off the, you know, really crappy patio that got built on. And that was kind of your connection to outside where the modernist houses have, like I said, courtyard, side yard, door out of the kitchen, door out of the main room, door out of the primary that really connects and makes that square footage that's smaller and petite feel like, oh my gosh, this thing's twice the size that it actually is. Uh, those tend to be kind of the, the hallmarks of, you know, mid-century modern is, uh, and vaulted ceilings too. It goes with that low slung roof, weirdly enough, is that there's no attic space. So it's a little weird in, right. uh, in Denver for insulation. Right. Uh, but they they function pretty well here. Um, and once you kind of start picking up on those main hallmarks, you'll see quite a few of them around the Denver metro area. Yeah. That's something that I think is really interesting is that over the last 10 to 15 years, everybody promotes the open concept and we have to remove walls and we have to blow stuff out from either pre-1950 or from 1980 on that you're right. Modernism had that nailed out of the gate yep. from the 50s, 60s, and a little bit of the 70s. It, yep. it was open from day one. You've got some structural components, but the way they built that with the A-frame, mm-hmm. it just accommodated for that anyway. Yep. So it's a, it's a cool kind of transition that people are already saw that coming out of the gate. Oh yeah. No, it's great that they had that. And it, uh, you know, it's, we're kind of seeing some of the rooms close back up and most of the time, the only thing you have to touch in these MCM's homes is the wall between the kitchen and the main living space. And now I know that's the, like, some people want that back outside of that. You kind of, most of those were half walls anyway. You can put it up, take it down. And otherwise, like you said, they were already open concept. They were already, you know, connecting all these rooms together. And then there was usually two main spaces, the bedroom wing and then the living wing. And yeah, the bedrooms are definitely tight, but it's one of those that like, you go to the bedroom, you go to sleep. Yeah. You're entertaining. You have this much bigger space rather than kind of that nineties hallmark where we got the, you know, the, the sitting room, the smoking room, the library, all within your primary suite, you know, in a 5,000 square foot house and 3000 is in the primary where you're like worthless space. What do I do with it? Yeah. And so it's, it, you know, it's nice to see we're kind of going back to that modern example where the portions of the bedrooms are getting appropriate, you know, taking out four sitting rooms instead, maybe having a small space and putting that space back into actual livability area in the entertaining area uh, next to the kitchen. So, and I kind of thinking about our audience, which is primarily people that are doing fix and flips, yeah. they're doing rental properties, they're leaning on the investment side. Right. Do you have a percentage or, or I don't want to call it formula, but maybe let's mm-hmm. use the per- term percentage. If you've got, if you've got simple comps on fixing up a property and selling it, I think we can all say there's a, a handful of mid-century modern properties. It's in a one mile radius. They're selling for 700 grand. You're feeling pretty comfortable. You can sell for 700 or a portion better depending upon your level of finish. What do you do, whether it's for you or for your clients, if you've got that lucky mid-century property in a neighborhood that's maybe not predominantly mid-century and the comps are at 700 and you've got this beautifully fixed up house, 
and it's similar in square footage, it's similar bedrooms. Do you have a percentage that you, that you feel like you can advise clients that say we could get X percent more or I kind of maybe try to put some math to that if you can? Yeah, no, weirdly enough, I had to do this. Uh, we had a really bad appraisal, uh, that been two years ago, uh, one-off house, absolutely stunning, custom tinted green brick. Uh, inside was somewhat updated uh, and the parts that were updated were really well done. Um, had a basement and basements are very uncommon in mid-century moderns. Right. So to get this extra square footage, one was unheard of. Uh, it wasn't too far from Arapaho Acres and those that are outside the Denver metro area, Arapaho Acres is one of the most known mid-century modern enclaves here in Englewood. This house was within that mile or so range from it. I guess diving even farther into this, uh, mid-century moderns within enclaves themselves and enclaves meaning every street and every house within that boundary of streets is a true mid-century modern house right. versus a one-off house where every house is a ranch and maybe the fifth house in is this really cool mid-century modern. Uh, both have more value than their neighbor, uh, classic house. The enclave itself has a much higher value percentage as the surrounding homes. The one-off has a higher, just not as high as within an enclave. Ours was the one off, but close enough to the enclave. So I did a whole bunch of research because the appraisal came in about 90K low. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. it, it I was also on this private park, dead end street. Oh, nice. Just a lot of things that, again, as an appraiser, I knew had value. Really hard to say that, oh, yeah, dead end street is worth you know $5 and a yeah. private park is worth $16. You knew they're worth more. You just you don't know how because yeah. you don't have an exact comp that says, oh, here's these two. We can compare, take that out, boil it down. So the, the value I found and I did, you know, Harvey Park and, and some of these enclaves where they're known for mid-centuries and I took houses that were an MCM, houses that were an exact ranch without a basement and dollar for dollar compared them and said, okay, what's the price per square foot on each of them? And wrote this basic dissertation for this appraiser to be like, nice. I understand that you, you have a job to do, I have a job to do, but I think you're wrong and, and here's why. And, you know, I, I got data. Yeah. I, I did math for it to, right. to explain it. It came out to be in the Denver metro area about 12 to 15 percent oh, above nice. as a direct comparison yep. of just price per square foot on things. Okay. Um, some enclaves got as high as 18 to 25 percent. Uh, the minimum was around that 10 percent range. That's great. And again, that's a very boiled down as you get into enclaves. Again, like I mentioned, they get a higher you know price per square foot difference. But as an average saying, hey, here's something that's a mid-century modern. Here's something that's not difference is somewhere in that 15-ish range on average, uh, which plays really well. And uh, again, there's no mid-century modern uh, adjustment number. Yeah, We've finally gotten to a point where enough of these have sold comparative to their ranch counterparts that are identical that appraisers do understand in Denver Metro and surrounding. There is a value held on MCMs where somebody may pay more as a price per square foot because they're art pieces, essentially. You know, they're, they're one of a kind. There's not many. There's a scarcity factor. So again, kind of jumping way back to your appraisal question, yeah. when you're talking to an appraiser and you have a unique property, it's making sure that they know the uniqueness of the property and, you know, reminding them that it's, you know, a Victorian with some really cool heritage in it, or it had all original things left right. in it that, you know, you preserve somehow that, you know, would work from that era was old growth and hand carved, you know, if you, you preserve that, that has some value in it. Uh, same with mid-century, you know, keeping some of those elements, by all means, some of the stuff's got to be updated. You got to get yeah. new plumbing, electrical, you know, get some of the things in. But preserving it, you're starting to get folks that appreciate that original feel and that value that it comes with, that it's quality materials. It's yeah. stuff that you can't get today without blowing your investment budget, by all means. You know, if you try to reproduce some of these houses with the tongue and groove ceiling, the wood ceilings and the beams, you know, it's $100,000 to rebuild that today. Yes. And you don't have the budget for that for just a ceiling type thing. Um, so that's, it's in that range that it's over. It's not a science of, hey, this is in this area. Here's the cross streets. It's, you know, 20,000 more because X, Y, Z. It is more. And I think it's really talking with that appraiser when you meet with them or talking with your seller about, hey, here's the true comps of it. Yeah, you know, across the street's less. And this is why I'm saying it's worth more. It's a more, it's in that, you know, 15-ish range. Uh, some can see even more than that. And again, it goes back to that artfulness of the house. It, it's a masterpiece. You know, it's uh, even if it's a Cliff May, which is technically a tract home here in Denver. Right. Uh, and they're stick built. They are glorified barns the way they're built. Yep. But there's some historical aspect to it. You know, it's a well-known national architect who actually never was an architect. He just got allowed into it. He was just yeah. such a good designer. Uh and Cliff May is one of them. He's one of my favorites from the Denver metro area. Uh, he just, the way he nailed things down, 
he spent a lot of time in the boardroom designing these houses. When they were built on site, they were actually built very, very rapidly. Um, there's some old YouTube videos out there about how quick the foundation was poured and oh, then cool. how quick it was done. It's because the, he did make it a science. He said, here's exactly where this 4x4 four four post goes. They were tip up uh, siding so that the siding went up. There wasn't every 14 or 16 inches, there wasn't a stud. It was pre-built six by six panels and they just went up on the outside. The roof fit perfectly. They were all within, you know, half of an inch every house. They were identical Yep. because he spent years in the boardroom saying like, okay, here's what we're going to do. Make these for the masses, these masterpiece houses. And they worked out and they were great. So it was, uh, thus for that reason, it was my favorite. It kind of made it for the masses of, you know, average Joe of 1950s could buy these really cool houses. Fortunately, the whole modernist movement was on the forefront of house movements. Right. We found some old documents that FHA and VA didn't really think that their notes that they were giving out to the mortgages were going to get repaid on the second purchase. They weren't going to be able to resold. So they were like, nah, I don't think I want to lend on these you know, modernist houses anymore. Right. We need to go to these ranches or two stories or these classical homes instead. Uh, and that's why most areas, California's the exception, they kind of petered off after that 1969 okay. switch to bi-levels, tri-levels, two stories. And the whole modernist thing fell off. A lot of it was driven by the main lender, which was the government at the time, FHA and VA, and just kind of kneecapped them. And part of the scarcity comes from the fact that they asked them not to be built because they wouldn't lend on them. And right. thus you get the one-offs that are so cool, but to somebody had to custom build it because at the time they couldn't do the tract homes like they were where we have Chrysanna Park. We have Linwood, again, two mid-century neighborhoods in the Denver metro area. We've got Arapahoe Acres and Arapahoe Hills. There's a couple other ones. But they're pretty scarce as full enclaves because at the time they were like, nah, I don't think these are going to be worth it after a while. And nobody's going to want to rebuy these houses. They're, they're too weird. Yeah. And that's something we always try to help our clients and our, our students and really just the general community of there's the great opportunities with flipping mid-century modern properties. And then there's some of those things you got to be careful of. And you brought up a great point. Chrisana Park is a, a nice little pocket or enclave. I love that term. Definitely going to keep using that. <laughs> um is that you just, the cost per square foot is astronomical. And the cool thing is, is normally when we're training people, we're saying, Hey, we're spending between 60 and $75 per square foot to fix up traditional properties. But the cool thing about mid mods is that yes, you need to lean towards that 75 because it needs to be a beautiful end product. But sometimes, and we always go to windows, you normally want to replace older single pane windows, but in mid mods, we typically don't because of the exact connection that you just described. So it's really knowing and working with experts and, and working with people that know what to take out and what to update and which things to leave alone and not touch and all those beautiful custom windows with different, you know, trapezoid style, you know, shapes and sizes. I mean, it's just, it's such a cool thing and a cool end product and you don't want to take those out. We want modern, uh, or I shouldn't say modern, updated kitchens and bathrooms to fit period specific styles right. and tastes, but you just don't have to gut it. So it's nice. Normally if you're looking at that house, you're going, oh man, I'm going to spend, you know, 200 grand to have a million dollar sales price point in mid months. Sometimes, you know, asterisk, you don't have have to do that. Are you right. finding that um, when, when you're doing your, your houses or you're advising yeah. your clients? No, absolutely. On the, you know, the flips I did when I first got in uh, doing the cliff maze, uh, Harvey Park, uh, again, just in, in Southwest uh, Denver, it never was a great area, never was a g bad area. Yeah. It just existed. It was an awesome spot. Uh, and it happens to be where all the cliff maze in Denver Metro area are. There's one outside of it. And they fell into what I call kind of the, the big box uh, Home Depot lows yeah. where whatever was trendy at those big box stores you put into the house. Yep. And this goes to your point of Victorians have a style, mid-centuries have a style. You know, ranches are a little more agnostic that they can be a little more open to things. Yep. Um, but, you know, doing the, my always biggest grievance is, you know, no shaker cabinets in a mid-century modern. Yes. Very easy. There you it go. Doesn't cost you any more. Yes. Listen, people, please <laughs> that, do not that's put the shakers one. in mid-mods. Yeah. And yes. it's, an, it's an easy, you know, when you go to the store and you pick out, you know, the uh, fixer and flip special. They're the same price. Sure, maybe a dollar more, whatever. But it, the flat fronts, that's what you want to go for. And it's those small things that you you know kind of want to find for it. And it does repay on the price per square foot. Uh, some of these kind of uh, super modernized or uh, contemporaryized houses that we see that are true mid-mods that get, you know, all of the wood paneling painted. And, you know, sure, some of the paneling can get put over. It might be super dark. But that paneling is old growth. A lot of that was yeah. uh, Philippine mahogany that got overforested and now it's extinct. And some of that's just super rare stuff to have. So it's incorporating kind of the new and the old. And I would say that grandma's house can be trendy and, mm -hmm. and not yeah. even trendy, but it, it fits the style of the house. You know, Victorian, again, I know farmhouse got super trendy and again, ranches, sure, shove it in there. Victorian's 
stop putting farmhouse into Victoria. Like they, they have a soul and yes. it doesn't seem to fit very well. And that's what we're seeing in the marketplace, whether it's a buyer or a fix and flipper that you're buying these houses and you want to make a certain style and you buy the house. If you stick to the style of the house, you get return in spades for it. Yeah. That again, flat fronts doesn't cost you more but you do it for a mid-century modern house. Yep. You have a bunch of wood paneling and your tongue groove ceiling. Again, that wood ceiling is still exposed. You don't have to paint it white. Yeah. You can keep it. You know, there are some ways you can, sure, maybe paint a paneled wall or two white in that room, but keeping that original ceiling there is worth something because it's so unique. And again, to reproduce today is very expensive. Thus, homes aren't doing it. So there's ways to, again, kind of thread that needle that says, yeah, you know, the X, Y, Z have got to be updated. But these things should probably stay. You know, if you've got a really cool moss rock wall and there's one of them, it doesn't make it too dark. No need to paint it. That's, yeah. that's a, again, part of that earth modernist feeling that really makes it pop and be different. Um, and that's what kind of folks are looking for today is, you know, if you completely take the soul out and make it, you know, the classic grage of everything. Grage has been overplayed, but it's also overplayed in niche homes. Again, if you grage out a Victorian house, I showed on Wash Park at 850. That was a steal. It's been sitting for almost two months. Yeah, you're right. And it's because they kind of lost every bit of character. All the brick was painted white. Every inside was drywalled over. There was no brick inside. It just felt like, yeah, you happen to be this old historic home in Wash Park, and it just didn't sell it. Yeah. And it was nice. It was great. It had the amenities you don't usually have in those. It actually had four bedrooms, had a full ensuite in the primary. Um, the basement slash cellar was finished out. That you could do a lot of storage. It was it checked all the boxes, but my buyers were just like. I, why would I pay, you know, this 850 number? Yeah, it's Wash Park, but I'd rather have this historic home next to me that might be a little more dilapidated, but it's got the character. You yeah. know, it's got that original wood in it. It's got XYZ that just make it feel like it's a true, you know, Victorian house. Same goes for the mid -mots. It's, you know, do what you can to preserve what you can in those. Uh, windows being one of them, weirdly. I have buyers that look at it that, you know, most of the windows of just kind of the square ones can get replaced mm -hmm. when you get the full panel floor to ceiling windows. Yeah. Buyers don't necessarily see it as a negative if it's not been replaced. Some of that is the price tag. It's transferred 10 times in 60 years and nobody's touched it. Yep. Because that window might be $5,000 for a single window. Yes. If you're there for 30 years, sure, have at it, replace it. Make sure you get another point for doing stuff. Do a thin bezel and bezel is the part that goes around the outside of the window that right. has the fins that go into the uh, frame of the house. Luckily, they're actually contractor grade for the most part when you have very thin bezels. You want to have that because it makes the window feel more like it's, you know, just this air between inside and outside. Yeah. When you get the thicker bezels, which is usually the higher end windows, it makes it feel like it's an actual window and you're kind of disconnecting the inside and outside. But again, it's a small little things like that. There's old school glaze in methods where you just buy the window and they kind of put stoppers around it and glaze it in that you could do that are not as energy efficient as right. regular windows, but those are essentially the right thing to do. It brings you closer to it today's and you get a double pane out of it. Uh, still expensive. Yeah. Um, and so those are, yeah, what you're doing a, a fix and flip on them. Some of those major windows, uh, especially the upper Claire store windows out of those triangle windows. Yeah, these are awesome. No need to touch them um, if they're like they are. And sure, if you've got a huge budget and you can do it, maybe as a live-in homeowner versus a flipper, have at it. Yeah. Uh, um, they don't really add or subtract value. They're just kind of accepted that you've got an old home and you've got some single pane windows here and there. Sure, if you've got a standard one, you can go pick up at Lowe's, that, you know, have at it, just get a small yeah. bezel, put it in that frame. But those floor to ceilings, you know, unless you can do them right, they're fine how they are. Most nice. of the most of the buyers don't really care. Nice. No, I think that's great insight. The good news is we could go for hours and hours and hours, but I've got two final questions for you as we kind of wrap up and wind down this one. And, and thank you so much for joining us. This has been definitely an education. Um, I think everybody in our industry talks about the best deals and the home runs, and, and we all made all this money flipping these houses, whatever. Give our audience a little bit of a, a deep dive into uh, a deal that you've done, or maybe for your clients where things just did not go right, and maybe the main reason why things just kind of went sideways. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so all my fix and flip, except for one condo, our very first one was a live-in that we did. We're all mid-century moderns. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually have a very unique model that because flipping isn't my primary business, my primary is the buying and selling and yeah. being the broker for the clients. Um, I still get approached or I go to a listing appointment and I say, hey, crap, this is actually a great deal for you and me. Why don't I just give you this cash lump sum? You can stay here for 60 days. You don't have to spend a penny to, you know, get it up on the market and we don't do this. We don't have a double commission. I'll give you the same price without commission. Um, cause I have a reputation in that field. I don't buy them cheap per se. I just get them off market. I'll still pay market price for them. 
I also always have the buyer for the houses that I purchase, right. which is again, very odd that usually you're like, okay, hopefully we can find a buyer. I won't pick them up unless I know I've got a buyer and then I can do a kind of interior model for what they want. Right. The one single house I didn't have a buyer for was the one that went awry. Uh, my contractor that I had, it would have been their third one they would have been doing for me. The one prior to that was my biggest success. We had it done in 32 days. It was 75K in profit. It was just, it was nice. seamless. It was great. Yeah. So I said, hey, I got another one. This is a month later. I have at it. Uh, so I kind of let them have their own space because the last two were just phenomenal. Uh, I checked in, you know, every so often. And towards the end, it just went completely downhill. And this is, again, I know everyone's pinch point contractor. Yeah. Uh, it was solely on the contractor side of things. Um, didn't go so well yeah. and they did a really crappy job. And so we had to, uh, every corner was cut and it shouldn't have been, oh. you know, I had, I had the budget for, you know, X, Y, Z to be cut, but yeah. not every single corner. Right. And so by the end product, it was like, wow, this looks really not great. Mm -hmm. And it sucks as against my reputation. It's in the cliff maze. Uh, it was a nice one because it had a small addition. So the living space was a lot bigger than most of the cliff maze. It was a two bed, which as folks know, in a detached house, two beds are a little bit harder to sell. We did add a bath in, so it was a two, two, but it was still at the end of the day, a two bed market was hot, but apparently not hot enough yeah. to overcome the crappy right. work that was done on it. Right. Um, and that, that was the issue is it was the, the contractor side. Um, some of it was my not checking in as much, but I had two previous deals with them that were just phenomenal. Yeah, it happens. And I, you know, they're the GC for a reason. I know I have to be the backup GC and I have the ability, but uh, it didn't go well. Um, took a little haircut on that one. Yeah. Um, you know, in, in the whole realm of things, I'm still very positive in the, you know, six that I've done. Of course. But that one was, it was a tough one that was like, hmm, that's great. And then in our personal life, we were, you know, buying a new house. We were moving and just a lot of pieces that was like, I just got to unload this. So uh, the buyer of that one got a pretty good deal. Yes. Um, yeah, there was some stuff to probably uh, cosmetically fix up afterwards. But, uh, you know, even as that would have been my fourth Cliff May that I did okay. and I was very good at them and it still just went awry and so kind of to your investor clients even if you're super professional I'm sure you come across it yeah every so often you know I could do this da daily there, there'll be a bad one yep. um, and you're just gonna have to roll with the punches and fix what you can and get it back on the market when you can um, sometimes it's a loss you, know, yeah. you can't can't win them all but you try to no and I love that context because as I said everybody kind of talks about the rock stars and these amazing deals but it just you're right it happens we all lose money from time to time um, you know it's just part of the part of the business and part of the game um, well Adrian it's been great having you on Raising the Flipping Bar I would Absolutely. love to have you just um, kind of end and close out with share with our audience how they can get a hold of you where do they contact you um, you know give us a, a way to, to track you down yeah thank you and I really appreciate you having me on here this has actually been a great time and I always love chatting with you um, online I've got my Instagram is probably my biggest uh, connection point. I uh, like to post listings that are around here and my own listings and kind of give some historical context and post, uh, which is on Instagram. The handle is at MidMod Colorado. Uh, so if you're on Instagram, you can look that up. Uh, and then I've got a lot of historical stuff about the neighborhoods and previous sales I've done and fix and flips I've done on my website, uh, which is www.comidmodhomes.com. Okay. Awesome. Adrian, thanks for joining us and we'll catch you on the flip side. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thanks.